Ah, life on the dark web. It's a dirty, dirty job, but someone's got to do it. But do they really? Well, even if someone doesn't have to do it, there's lots of people that do. And what they get up to is their business and their business alone. But it is the subject of tonight's little story. Another fantastic one from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit that I set up so you could send your stories to me and I could read them back to you. And the dark web it is. Haven't been there for a while and very much looking forward to making a return this evening. So buckle up, my dear friends, because it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. My story is a long one and mostly uneventful. And that's the way I like it. Uneventful, quiet, forgettable. However, there are times that stand out. Times that I'd prefer to forget. And times which I wish I could relive forever. It's these moments in my life that I've come to share with you. Maybe to clear my conscience. Maybe to simply get it off my chest. <laughs> Dirty secrets and all that. Do keep in mind, though, that there will be many details that I must omit for obvious reasons. Chief among them, my own safety. Chances of the people I'll mention here finding this are low, however, precautions must be made. My username is fake, the names in these stories are fake, but the events, on the other hand, are very real. I work on the dark web, running an online business of sorts, through a warehouse I own, it's a front that makes me all my taxed income and keeps the feds off my back. Helps me clean money as well. The front is simple auto repair. And I do actually have customers and an established clientele. But the real money is made on the clever use of my property. It's a large 15,000 square foot rectangle with offices in the front and the very rear and with multiple partitions in between. Bay doors in the rear of one side even allow for large, big rigs to back up and load or offload their cargo. It's situated deep in an industrial complex in the central Florida area, in the home of the Big Mouse himself. The place was perfect for the operation that I'd set up over the last few years. Easy access parking lot, access through four different driveways and two different roads, one of which is a dead end, but it makes for easy freight truck deliveries. Speaking of which, I'm a fixer, obviously of cars, but for the dark web as well. Like I said before, I use my property for most of the work. Sometimes it's simply a dead drop location. Someone drops off a package and someone else usually comes by sometime later to retrieve that package. Those are the easiest. I don't even see anyone the majority of the time. Just a notification on my cell of funds being placed into my PayPal or Venmo account. No risk to me. I never even knew the package was there. Other times someone hands me a payment directly. I like these the most. Usually I charge a fee based on shipment size and storage length. And cash payments are the best. Cash doesn't get seen by a big brother. Well, if you're smart about it. I'm not, unfortunately. So I keep someone on the payroll who is... They manage not only my personal and legal business accounts, but the <coughs> off-the-books accounts as well. Sometimes I make hot items disappear. Automobiles, electronics, parts for one thing or another, doesn't really matter. Sometimes I'll buy the product myself. Other times I work for a broker. A little more complicated, a little higher risk, a little off the top for the broker, but a bigger cut at the end of the day. And sure, if I get caught with this stuff, it's certainly jail time for me. But that's the beauty of a place that's out of the way. Nobody really comes snooping around unless they're looking for trouble. I'm also the last stop in a lot of delivery chains for the Orlando area. A package will be dropped off without any exchange of words. Simply a slip of paper with a code or phrase on it. A few hours may pass, maybe a day and someone else will drive in to claim it, simply handing off another slip of paper containing a matching phrase. I really only have one rule to this job. No talking. I don't want to know your name, where you came from, how the weather is. No, none of that. 
Your life and mine don't get to mix. I don't talk to you, you don't talk to me. Nobody gets in trouble and we all get paid. Of course, that's the way I like to run things. It doesn't always go as planned though. And that brings us to both my least and favourite part of working on the dark web. Actually dealing with people from it. Like I said once already, I'm a fixer. Sometimes I'm fixing people, sometimes I'm fixing their problems. Many times that happens to be other people. I'm no stone cold killer, and I won't be. The pay isn't high enough for that. I'll rough someone up if I'm paid to, and I'll protect what's mine if need be. Now, with the introduction out of the way, I'll choose the name Jack for these little confessions. I like to think I'm a jack of all trade when it comes to this stuff, so, well, there you go. Our story starts way back, about ten years ago, on a Floridian winter day. I was about a year into the business before my first major problem happened. I had little things happen in the past, like shipments that never got to me, or deliveries that never made it to their destination from my location. You know, stuff like that. This time was different, though. Nobody arrived to take receipt of a shipment. I walk the warehouse twice a day. Once when I arrive in the morning, and once before I go home. It wasn't unusual to see cargo not move for a few days, even a week. Many times it would come and go without me knowing when. I just get the payment for being a dead drop. Now, by this point, I only had two of what I now call lanes sectioned off. One for packages that would come and go quickly, a day or two at most. Another section that was designated long term, though, like I said, nothing more than a week really stayed there. These days, the business is bigger, with more product, and I will see things sitting around for weeks in my long term lane. But this was long before I had my first long term storage request, and it was actually supposed to be in and out within the same day. It was a single box, about four feet long and about six by six inches tall and deep. <sighs> I do keep a vague log on a burner computer. At the time, it lived in a fire safe, locked inside of a gun safe with three separate locks that was anchored into the concrete floor in the only furnished office in the back of the building. <laughs> I say furnished, but it only had a folding desk, a small rolling chair, the safe, an incinerator and a mini fridge in which I kept a couple bottles of good whiskey for the rare occasion I discussed business on site. I'd take loose notes on what was in the warehouse in the morning, match it with what I was expecting to be there, and repeat at the end of the day. Taking the notes on a single sheet of paper that I would burn after logging into the computer. Now, I can already hear you ask, why transfer it to the computer at all? If you're trying not to have any evidence, then why bother with the computer? Well, to that, I simply say, if I'm found out. It doesn't matter if I even burn the computer. The whole thing is happening inside of my building, and my fingerprints are everywhere. Nothing to be done about that. If worse comes to worst, there's a firebomb set to trigger upon my not diffusing it, and resetting the timer at least once every few days. And yes, there is a second one inside the fire safe, with a computer in it as well. <laughs> it's risky, sure. But as they say, a life without risk isn't one worth living. So, my daily routine is, arrive about six in the morning. Reset the security measures. Spend a couple hours taking inventory and matching that inventory to my register. Go back to the front and run the shop which is basically just manage my regular employees, who get taken care of if they get nosy, of course. When the day is done, I lock up the front, take inventory a second time, and leave when I'm ready. Sometimes it's as early as four, sometimes as late as ten. It depends on what's going on. Now usually, a purchase on the dark web can be made in a variety of ways. Payment in full before shipping, after shipping, Split through some percentage before and after delivery, you name it. It just depends on the seller preference most of the time. I'm sure you can imagine that buyer's remorse isn't really a thing that we have to deal with either. You understand. It's like 
If you buy drugs from someone and you get ripped off, you can't really go to the cops and tell them you tried to buy coke and got powdered sugar instead. Oh, I knew this particular seller, though, was a payment in full, upfront type of character, so his delivery network was stout. And yet here, this box was. Unmarked except for the letters and numbers I asked to have on them to identify them. And it's still here, after its pickup time. Now, I don't mind keeping things around for extra time, don't get me wrong, but it was taking up space and someone was going to need to pay for that slot. I run a business, not a charity, and space in my warehouse, even in the early days, was limited. And I didn't rent that space for beer money either. So, when I sat down at the end of the day to make my notes and do my paperwork, I sent a message to the shipper. I do have that information, of course. Not where they came from or anything, just just who they'd come from. Now, this guy, we'll call him Steve, was a regular for me. He wasn't a big mover, but he was consistent, and so were the people he used to pick up as well. Usually. Exceptions to every rule and whatnot. Oh. So, I sent him a message, expecting him to get back to me the next day or so, not really thinking much of it while I set back to work on the rest of the inventory. About 15 minutes went by before the burner phone I used as a contact number for this business rang. I didn't answer it. I always let it go to voicemail first. If it's important, they'll leave a message and I'll call them back. Sure enough, there was a message less than a minute after the phone stopped ringing. I played it back. Call me back. The voice on the other side was rugged. A two-pack-a-day smoker type of rugged. It could be Steve. So, I did as I was asked. It rang once more before being picked up, though there was only silence on the other end. Steve? I asked cautiously. Yeah, the voice responded after a moment. The guy who was supposed to pick up didn't do it? No, new guy? I asked. I wasn't a fan of business over the phone then. Still don't like it, but I make exceptions from time to time. No, this was supposed to be one of my regulars. Well, I started. I'll keep in an extra day, on the house, but past that... Oh, I trailed off. Yeah, I got it. I'll do what I can. I'll call you from this number again if I can't get it moved on time. Good, I replied, hanging up. It was important to be firm and to the point. Exude power and authority, but don't overstep it. Steve was a good customer, always paid on time, almost never had packages sitting longer than they were supposed to. So I gave him the extra day. It was good for relations to do a pro bono case once in a while. Word gets around. Well, it's how I've built what I have now. Firm, but understanding. So I finished my work for the day. Locked up the warehouse and was getting into my car when a red pickup truck pulled into the parking lot. It was almost nine and I was ready to go home. The next day was Friday and I was really looking forward to my weekend, which started on Friday. I think now is a good time to mention that I have high definition cameras set up on the inside and outside. Hot shit back in the day. I also had a security door put in place with a keypad that changed its code once a week. This code was sent to a computer I had set up at home as a server. It, in turn, sent the information to people who would need it to make their deliveries or pick up. The whole thing was set up by a tech-savvy friend of mine. All I had to do was send the information via a messenger from my laptop at the warehouse, which I did at the end of every day. Needless to say, I wasn't worried about people coming and going throughout the night. If, and it was a big if, anything were to be suspect, I'd know every detail I'd need to. Normally, with the security being there, I'd leave and not bother to look back. I had a few clients that looked out for me for one reason or another, and I could call on them if I needed to. Protection of product is a big deal with some of the more expensive items that may get moved through my hands. But today... Something nagged at me to stay behind and wait. Could have been the fact that I had an undelivered shipment sitting in the lane. Could have just been nerves. Whatever it was, 
it made me wait and watch as this pickup truck reversed up to the back door. Two guys got out, leaving the truck running. They approached the door, but didn't punch the code into the keypad. Instead, they turned back around and opened the tailgate, both of them hoisting out a long pry bar, looking right out of the truck bed. It must have been heavy, because it took the both of them to lift it. They jammed it under the door and wrenched it upward, the both of them. The metal door buckled and bent, but didn't come off the hinges, though there was a visible gap, even to me from across the parking lot. They then stuffed a chain into the space at the top, fished it out from under and through the bottom of the door, wrapping it around the trailer hitch to secure it. One ran around to the driver's side of the truck, hopped in and put it in drive, speeding away from the door. The chain pulled tight and ripped the door from the frame. The sound was louder than I expected, as the door bounced and slid across the parking lot. The driver got out, unhooked the chain, then backed the truck up to the now doorless doorframe. They were in a hurry. He left the door open and the truck running as they rushed inside. They hadn't noticed me sitting in my car, parked diagonally about 50 feet away. There were no streetlights in the back, only one dim light that illuminated the now empty doorway. So not only did they not see that I was there, but they didn't see me retrieve the silence 9mm that I kept in the glove box. Now, like I stated before, I'm no hitman, but nobody deals within the dark web without protection. One of the early payments I'd received at some point had been the gun and its silencer. It wasn't anything special by any means, but it would get the job done if need be. I approached the truck first, peeking in to see if there was anyone still inside. I'd left the doors open, so I wasn't really taking any unnecessary risks. I approached the door, stepping through the condensation coming back from the truck's tailpipe. The temperature had dropped into the low 40s as night had fallen, and though the cold wind bit at my nose and fingertips, my heart was pounding in my ears. There was sweat around my neck, and I had to force a smirk from my face, remembering that this was business. Peeking around the doorway, I saw the two guys scanning the lanes, walking slowly away from me. I heard one say, I know it's long, Addressed to some guy named Augustine, or some pretentious shit. I didn't see any weapons on them, but that didn't mean they didn't have any. I pulled the neck warmer up over my nose and mouth, and entered the darkened warehouse. I knew where they were, and I knew the layout of the place like the back of my hand. If I played my cards right, I could get the drop on them. I prefer not to have to kill anyone, but if it came down to it, I was prepared. I stuffed the pistol in the back of my waistband and picked up a crowbar from the corner of the room as quietly as I could, creeping in closer. It's got to be around here some fucking place. The guy said he hadn't picked it up yet. At least he was right about the place being empty at night. Will you shut up already? The other said. Breaking into this place is fucking risky. Who knows whose stuff this is? Want to peek around? The first asked stopping for a moment and looking around with a flashlight at all the boxes and crates stacked all around him. <sighs> Could be some good shit just waiting to be taken. Fuck no, you moron. Didn't you hear me? A lot of this stuff probably belongs to people who would kill you like it was fashionable. Let's just get what we came for and get the fuck out of here. When the guy closest to me had his back turned, I stepped from cover and got within striking distance and swung the crowbar like a baseball bat, slamming it into the side of the guy's head. I tried not to swing it with all my might, and there was definitely a deep thunk when it connected. But the adrenaline was racing now, and I disappeared into the shadows before the guy had even hit the floor. The flashlight dropped onto the ground first, the bulb inside blowing out. To this day, I think that's what saved me from getting caught, because it rolled right over to face me. It was stealthy, sure, but it was definitely not unnoticed by the second guy, who seemed to have found what he wanted and was picking it up when I'd hit the first guy. 
The guy I hit never really made any vocal sounds, but his body hitting the floor sure did, and his friend snapped around, turning the flashlight in what he thought was his friend's direction. I couldn't see him clearly because of the flashlight, but he was definitely moving in my direction now, searching for me. I made a move around some large crates, trying to get behind the second guy. Oh, fuck, man. I knew this was a bad job, he whispered, mostly to himself, as he approached his friend. Dude, get up. He was looking around with the flashlight now, panicking more every second. Oh, come on, man, get up. I rushed at the second man, swinging the crowbar around his neck and pulling him back onto me. We fell to the ground. The struggle itself is a little vague. He hit me in the head a couple times, trying to get free, but well, I held steady, keeping the crowbar where it was, and after what felt like minutes of the guy struggling, he slipped into unconsciousness. I pushed him off of me with a groan. I walked over and flipped on a couple of overhead lights and set to work, getting the guys tied up with some ratchet strap tie downs. I pulled out my phone and called Steve again. Two rings this time, and he answered. Hey. His voice came through as rough as the first time. Whatever you've got sitting in my warehouse is hotter than shit, and I want it gone. My tone was flat. I could hear him sigh heavily, and then... Oh, fuck. I'll be there myself in an hour. Yeah. And you can help deal with this mess you created as well. I don't like to think I'm a demanding guy or anything. But I was still running on the adrenaline, and the cigarette I'd lit wasn't helping in the least. Ah, oh, hell. He sounded a little more distraught, but more out of inconvenience than anything. Okay, I got some guys in the area that I can call on. Be there soon. And with that, he hung up. I pulled the guys I'd clobbered over into one of the empty offices and locked them inside. The one I'd hit with the crowbar was bleeding pretty bad. But it didn't look like I'd cracked his skull or anything, so I just wrapped his head up in some cleanish shop rags and duct tape and left him tied up there. I didn't need some guy dying on my property if I could help it. Bad mojo, that. I walked outside and parked the truck out of the way and dragged the door inside. The wind was picking up and I could smell the smoke of a fire probably made by some homeless guys to keep warm, but it was otherwise quiet. I lit a second cigarette and waited, pacing back and forth, down one of the lanes, listening intently. But the only thing I could hear was my own heartbeat, just beneath the sound of my footsteps on the dusty floor. The adrenaline was starting to come down, when I heard the sound of vehicles pulling up outside. I peeked out again, grabbing the grip of the gun under my coat and approaching the door. I heard one set of footsteps approach, then a familiar voice call out. Hey, Jack, it's me. I relaxed, exiting the warehouse to meet Steve face to face for the first time in our many month-long partnership. He extended a hand slowly. I took it in mine. He was a big guy, much larger than myself. Biker look, oh, leathers, bandana, white hair and a beard. Chains and rings, oh. Like he walked straight out of Sons of Anarchy or some shit. Steve, I said mildly. Jack, he nodded back. Let's get this over with, shall we? I was stressed enough as it is, anxious to get home and have a stiff drink. He nodded, first to me, then over his shoulder, to the seven guys who were filing out of the two new trucks parked in the loading dock. They all wore black cargo pants, work boots, and black hoodies with the hoods up. Classic gangbangers. Though, I didn't bother looking at any of their faces. I didn't want to know, nor did I care. Take that truck over there on your way out, I said, pointing at the truck the guys had driven in with. Okay, no problem, Steve said. One of the guys broke off right away to go over to it. So, what happened? I was just about to leave, I said, walking inside, expecting the others to follow. These two rolled up, 
yanked my door off and just made themselves at home. I walked over to where I'd set the package off to one side, on one of the long countertops, and handed it to Steve. He took it with both hands, carefully. The two guys you gotta take care of are in the first office on the right, through that hallway. I pointed through an open door and handed the key to the room to Steve, who handed it to one of the guys in black. His only distinguishing feature was he looked like every generic white bouncer in every club in Orlando. Jacked, square jaw and shaved face. Looked like he was constantly smelling someone's shit. The six guys went in and carried the two guys out, handing me the key back on their way past. Steve and I just stood in the warehouse for a minute until they were gone. Um, drink? I asked, lighting a third cigarette. Yeah, he responded with a heavy sigh. He followed me to my little office that overlooked the floor, and I poured two glasses of a 15-year whiskey, handing him one. So what's this going to cost me? he asked expectantly. Though I knew it was coming, I hadn't really thought of any kind of cost yet. <laughs> Some cash, obviously. But this kind of trouble is the first we've had. I took a light sip from the glass, feeling the smooth amber whiskey slide down my throat. <sighs> Tell you what, I sighed. Give me a stack and clean up the mess for me and we'll call it square. The door too? I nodded. Yeah, man. If you could get that replaced tonight... I'll get it refitted with a new lock tomorrow. Deal, he said, taking a swig from his own glass. He looked into his cup a moment. Damn, good stuff. Normally, I don't really want to know, I said, turning away from the window to face him. But what's in the box? Are you sure you want to know? He asked, raising a bushy eyebrow. I thought about it a moment. Yeah, I do. What was worth breaking into an underworld storage facility and risking your life for? Look, these guys knew that there was some shit in this warehouse. They knew it was connected to some seriously shady and powerful people. What was worth that risk? He set the box down on the table, pulled out a switchblade and cut the tape open. You sure? He asked once more. I merely gestured with the glass in my hand. He opened the cardboard box and pushed aside the packing peanuts, lifting out a long, thin black case. It was the deepest black I'd ever seen. It didn't shine or even look like any kind of material that I'd ever seen before. It was like my eyes couldn't quite adjust to looking at it. I couldn't see a seam or a hinge or anything. When he set it down on my desk... It looked like someone had opened a window into the vacuum of space. You gotta open it for yourself, though. I'm not gonna do it for you, he said, looking away. That should have been warning enough. This guy looked like the type of guy who ate nails for breakfast, and had probably seen things that would keep me up for days. Even as I sit here, recounting this, I know I'm not gonna be sleeping for a few nights. What I saw inside that box defies all logic, all reason. Nothing I'd ever seen before or since has come close to giving me the vertigo than what was inside that black void. What I saw when I lifted the lid of that box didn't have a form I could put into words. I only saw it for a second before I dropped the lid closed again. Turning for the trash can, I emptied my stomach of its contents and instantly broke out in a cold sweat. What? I stammered, my composure completely broken. What is that? I don't know. But the guy who brought it told me it wasn't from our dimension, whatever that means. Steve was placing it carefully back inside the packing material and closing the flaps on the box when I turned back around to face him. I'm sorry this thing caused you the trouble it did. I didn't think anyone would be trying to get their hands on it. Look, I've got some connections that will track down. I raised my hand to cut him off. <sighs> I don't want to know. I breathed. Just pay me the deuce and we'll put this behind us. I don't want to hear about it again. 
And I didn't. Steve and his crew left after putting a new door on the hinges. And I went home to drink myself into a stupor for a couple of days. Until a couple of weeks ago, I'd all but forgotten about it. But after writing this, it'll be another few sleepless nights drinking to forget. Well, I really enjoyed reading that one. Tell me what you think in the comment section below, because it sounds like it's the beginning of a new series, doesn't it? Well, I do so hope it really is, because that was a lot of fun. It seems like there's a lot of story left to go. Well, it's Friday again, and with any luck on Sunday, I'll be drawing the Vigilante series to a conclusion. If not, then I'll definitely be back with you next Monday. Until then, my dear, dear friends, have a lovely weekend. Good night and sweet dreams. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>